This analysis of Jack 3 will take an in-depth look at the game's design. My previous video on Jack 2 was very mechanically focused, and I'll be trying to avoid repeating myself here, so I'd recommend watching that one first. In this video, I'll only be bringing up mechanics if they're new or changed in some way. For an introduction to Jack 3, I'm going to quote from the game's page on GameFAQs. By the end of the video, it should be clear why. In 2004, Naughty Dog released Jack 3, which, quote, combines elements from a variety of genres, including driving, adventure, action, puzzle, strategy, and exploration. Jack is banished to the Wasteland, a desert environment five times the size of Haven City. Given the expansiveness and variance in terrain, vehicles play a large role in each mission. The game unveils more vehicles, guns, and dark powers, and introduces light powers." End quote. That's a fair few genres there, but Jack 3 starts out innocently enough with a movement tutorial similar to the one in Jack 2. There's also some gun combat right off the bat. Jack 3 won't stray from Jack 2's formula anywhere near as much as 2 did from 1. Leaving the tutorial, the player is introduced to the new hub, Spargus City. You won't be spending a whole lot of time here though. Spargus represents one of the best changes from Jack 2 to 3. Though the open world structure hasn't been rethought entirely, this time the city is small and missions are usually very close together. In fact, some mission start points are at the previous mission's end point, meaning that the game keeps its momentum going constantly. Very few missions in Jack 3 are given by quest givers. Instead of driving to point A to get a mission and driving to point B to start the mission, in Jack 3 they'll often be one and the same. Driving to point A will give the mission and start the mission from the same point. Coupled with the smaller hub areas, this cuts down on travel time dramatically. There are 60 missions in Jack 3, give or take, roughly the same amount as were in Jack 2, but Jack 3 is about 4 hours shorter, almost entirely because it cuts out the travel time. Considering how much I hated wasting those hours travelling through the empty open world of Jack 2, if you ask me, this is a major and indisputable improvement. The game then totally shatters this positivity by having another one of those Simon Says mini games as the third mission. We'll come back to this, don't you worry. Jack 3's major new core mechanic is driving, which means two of Jack 3's core mechanics are driving. In this case I'm talking about the new four-wheel buggy driving in the desert, not the hover cars from Jack 2, though they do reappear. The car is introduced with some more button prompts. At this point it can stop, go, skid, and jump, though the jump is mostly used for getting the car unstuck from rocky geometry. There's only one major car platforming challenge. What's interesting about that skid is that it isn't a drift. Drifting typically shifts the car's momentum from the front to the side, allowing the cart to take a sharp corner while still maintaining momentum. In Jack 3 this is a skid instead. The front wheels stop moving and the back ones slide out from under, changing the direction but halting momentum. This makes the cars feel heavy and more realistic, more like Gran Turismo than Crash Team Racing. But since we're talking about Jack and Daxter here, there's a better reason for this than realism. In a kart racer, races are linear, there's a set path and you're trying to get to the end of it as fast as possible. So you always want to be going forwards, it has level or track design. Drifting preserves this forward momentum around sharp turns. Jack 3's driving all takes place in an open world desert, it's the polar opposite. With so much space sprawling out in all directions, it's just as important to be able to make a sharp 130 degree turn and head in a completely different direction as it is to preserve forwards momentum. Having a skid here instead of a drift fits well with the desert, which has world design but not level design. The problem with the driving is pretty much everything else, although the key issue is traction. Cars in Jack 3 have very low traction or grip on the sand. Despite including a skid button, trying to make a smooth, rounded turn will usually send the car skidding around anyway. In practice, this means that there's no way to make anything but the absolute smallest of adjustments to the car's course without spinning out. You either skid to change direction, or you drive in a straight line. The skid button doesn't need to be here because the turning controls serve the same purpose. There's very little in between where you can turn the car maybe 30 degrees to the left while retaining your speed and momentum. The end result is a feeling of driving with ice physics. 
I do wonder if this is an attempt at realism. I don't have much experience driving on sand, but I'd imagine it's not exactly Velcro. Without many other surfaces to drive on though, I can't say for sure which came first, the feel of the driving or the desert setting. I'd be missing the core of the issue if I just wrote it off as too realistic. The workaround for the lack of traction is, of course, to feather the accelerator and take those more rounded turns at quarter speed. If this were, say, Gran Turismo, this would be part of the challenge. Do you feather your brakes around that bend, or can the car take the corner at top speed? Even there though, you can take at least some corners at full speed. It's perhaps a bit harsh and unnecessary that an ancillary driving mechanic in Jack and Daxter is less forgiving than Gran Turismo. Still, if the next GT were to have a beach track, controls this unforgiving would be completely fitting, and not just because GT aims for realism. It's the competition and focus of Gran Turismo which gives the nuanced and sometimes obtuse controls context. If I spin out in GT, I know I need to learn how to take the corner better, learning the ins and outs of driving is the whole point of the game. If I'm not willing to practice and improve, I can't blame the game for that, I should just go and play a more lenient racer. If I spin out in Jack 3, I've just been delayed from arriving at my goal by a few seconds. It might slightly irritate me, but there's no drive to be better. By simply asking the player to drive from point A to point B, instead of placing them up against some form of pressure, the obtuse controls become an obstacle to progress instead of a system which must be mastered to succeed. If I flip my car while driving to a blip on the minimap and all I'm up against is a generous time limit, I've been delayed by a few seconds but I'm not under enough pressure to need to improve. If I flip my car during a race, I'm going to lose, so I do need to improve. In other words, there's very little which is outright wrong with Jack 3's driving, even if I would have tightened up the traction, but because it doesn't demand the player master the driving's nuances, there's no reason for it to be this obtuse. You can't nail down exactly how it's deficient because it isn't, it's overly complex instead. It's a perfectly functional system placed in the wrong context. It's an issue of mission design, not of the wasteland itself. There are two ways to fix this. The traction could have been tightened up, which would have had no impact on the way the driving currently presents challenge, only removed frustration. Or the controls could have been left alone, but the driving missions would then need to provide a more relevant context, like racing, to encourage that mechanical skill. And there is one race in Jack 3, at least it's the only one in the main game. It comes right at the beginning, 20 minutes in. There's nothing strictly wrong with it, it even serves to illustrate the way races contextualise the mechanic, but it comes too early to be effective. As the first driving mission after the buggy tutorial, the player is unlikely to have a good understanding of how the car handles before the race begins. The mission immediately after is a connect the dots round trip to pick up some artifacts, and I wonder if this should have been placed before the race, to give the player a better impression of how the car handles. It's the exact opposite of the hover car driving in Jack 2. In that case, the player had been driving back and forth across the city for hours, under no pressure but subconsciously learning the various quirks of the controls. This went on for a good few hours before the game tested driving skills with three difficult races. Buggy driving in Jack 3 should have followed the same structure, beginning the game with some casual driving missions and then putting in a handful of races later on would ensure that the player first has a good subconscious understanding of how the car handles and then give them a good context to master it in. Here, the opposite is true. The game forces the player to learn the car's handling immediately and then never asks them to be good at it ever again. For what it is, the race is probably the most enjoyable driving mission the game has. It's the rest of the driving missions, which forgive sloppy driving, that fail to justify the controls by testing the player on them. I could try to argue the buggies don't belong in a Jack and Daxter game at all, but between Jack 2 and 3 there are so many disconnected core mechanics that it's hard to say what isn't fair game for Jack and Daxter now. At this point I should make it clear that I'm only considering the main game. I know there are more racing side missions, but I believe a game should put its best foot forward with its main content, not relegate the good stuff to side missions. 
If the optional races can be accessed at any time, then they don't have a set point on the difficulty curve, meaning there's no way to know what level of skill they expect. If I pick out an optional race at random while playing through the main game, there's every chance it's either already redundant or far beyond my current skill level. Instead, from this point on, Jack 3's main driving missions all, yet again, involve driving somewhere with no competition and or shooting something. Most cars come with forward mounted guns, which means that the cars use character relative aiming just like Jack, although car relative might be less of a mouthful. Unlike on foot though, car relative aiming integrates with the movement of driving quite well. I don't think anyone is expecting a car to start strafing. But there's a better justification here than it might have looked stupid. By making enemies moving targets, the challenge becomes chasing them and keeping the car facing at them while shooting. You have to make sure you're both driving well and also lining the enemy up for the guns. It's nothing complex, but it does give some of that satisfaction which the on-foot aiming lacks. If you're tailing a moving target well, you're usually facing towards them. There's at least the satisfaction of driving well, if not aiming well. Standing in one place and letting the auto-aim do all the work has neither. I don't even need to show footage of on-foot gunplay to prove that. One driving mission has you shooting at stationary targets with a turret that aims automatically, and by requiring no driving or aiming skill, it's just as unsatisfying as the ground combat. In the case of the cars and missions which require a little more thought, I might have added a reticle for the area where bullets will land, but just like on foot, the simplistic car combat attempts to complement the driving mechanics rather than supersede them. Unlike the on foot combat, I think having to line up shots and still drive well gives it just enough complexity to be satisfying. The Wasteland itself has many of the same problems as Haven City, but despite its size, they're significantly less intrusive. Many desert missions are given in Spargus, meaning that once you exit the city, the mission has already begun. Instead of driving across Haven to be given a mission and then driving across Haven as part of the mission, driving across the desert is the mission. It's like if missions in Jack 2 were always given in the slums section of Haven and the rest of the open world had been reserved solely for the missions in progress. Very few missions are actually initiated by driving to a location in the desert, so this cuts down on travel time even further, but also repetition. You won't be travelling over the same parts of the desert anywhere near as many times as the districts of Haven. There is one exception. The path to the Precursor Temple is a lengthy drive away from Spargus, and you'll be making the trip three or four times. Getting there requires some pretty silly looking car platforming, which isn't particularly interesting more than once. I do wonder though if this is to build anticipation. Every time you go to the Precursor Temple, Jack gets a new light eco power. It's by far the longest trek you'll ever have to make to a mission start point in the entire game, and one of very few that come close to anything in Jack 2, so it sticks out. Obviously I can't know if this was intentional, but I can say that as a kid, I remember getting excited about a new light jack power every time I saw that little Precursor map icon. At least on a first playthrough, I think having that travel time works as a good contrast when it's used sparingly, and not between every single goddamn mission. Reaching the Precursor Temple for the first time is where we get our first true platforming section since the tutorial. Yep, I've been talking about parts of the game as they came up. Every element I've gone over so far comes earlier than any actual platforming. So this part is pretty good. Some familiar pole swinging reminds me of the platforming groove of Jack 1 and... Oh, there's a... There's a glider minigame. Right. We'll come back to that. The game's first true full-length platforming level comes after, and my footage tells me it's bang on an hour into the game. There's not much to say about the level design here that wasn't already said in the Jack 2 video. The challenge comes from enemy numbers and pits to fall into. There isn't much in the way of level gimmicks to recontextualise jumping and shooting. As the first proper platforming level in the game though, that's to be expected, and the simplicity isn't an issue yet. The jet board also makes its return in the Precursor Temple, and again features some of the better level design in the game, chaining grinds and some platforming obstacle courses together in ways which subtly increase the difficulty. 
The first rail is just a rail, then it's a rail that needs a jump to collect something, then it's a rail which actually has a gap in the middle. It's nothing earth shattering, but for those who never played Jack 2, this is an elegant way to bring them up to speed with what the game will demand of them on the hoverboard. The next platforming level, which comes surprisingly soon after, has a clever gimmick which rethinks melee attacks. You need to punch these little creatures into these wheels to activate some platforms, but can only punch them a few times before they die. This is the kind of approach I like to see, rethinking how core mechanics can be used and contextualised. But the problem is, the game repeats it four more times verbatim. It's clever the first time, maybe even the second, but doing it five times in a row without any sort of twist makes even something imaginative feel repetitive fast. Maybe for the last one have the enemy spawn a good distance from the wheel, so you need to make efficient use of every punch you can dish out before it dies to get it all the way there. Still, this is better than the vast majority of the level design in Jack 2 because it actually tries, even if it stretches one good idea a little too far. Haven City then makes a reappearance, and war has changed it for the better. It adheres to the same ideals as Spargus City, its size has been drastically reduced, and most mission start points are at most 30 seconds away from mission end points. The city does eventually open up, but the game only ever asks you to drive from one side to the other a total of four times. I think this again illustrates the point about contrast. When the game only asks you to make that trek a handful of times, it can be relaxing after a particularly action-packed series of missions. Periods of downtime used with restraint can be as useful a tool as anything else. There's been one other positive change made to Haven. This time, there's some stuff to do in it. Some short platforming paths have been dotted around the city, usually involving the hoverboard. These are a few seconds of linear platforming built out of bits and pieces of the open world, with a precursor orb or two as a reward at the end. The closest comparison I can think of is Assassin's Creed. There are often bits and pieces of the open world which form linear paths when chasing after a collectible from a specific angle. I'd certainly argue that you might as well just make a linear game if the points of interest in your open world are going to be linear anyway, but without rethinking the open world structure, this is certainly an improvement over the totally barren, glorified mission select menu of Jack 2. There's also some fighting going on in the streets if you want to hone your gunplay skills, although with the changes made to gunplay in Jack 3, it's not like you'll need to. There are a lot of new guns in Jack 3, but they all follow one central idea. None of them ask the player to aim. There's a ricochet shot, an automated turret, a snaking arc of electricity, a straight up homing shot, a shockwave, a grenade launcher with a large blast radius, an anti-gravity gun, and a screen nuke. Not a single one of these requires the player to aim any better than in the general direction of an enemy. At most, with the electrical arc or grenade, you might need to be pointed within 90 degrees of them, and at the least, with the ricochet blaster shot, you can be facing directly away from them and your shot might still bounce off a wall and hit them anyway. Now in Jack 2, the player didn't have to aim perfectly either. There was some heavy auto-aim involved to ensure most shots hit a mark, because the character relative aim wasn't accurate enough for the player to line up shots on their own. Still, they had to at least be trying, Tapping slightly left and right would ensure the auto-aim found its mark a little faster. This wasn't necessarily better. Shooting in Jack 2 was unsatisfying because the aiming controls didn't allow the level of accuracy the game design demanded. The game itself was aware of this, so it did most of the work for you with the auto-aim. I see two possibilities with Jack 3. One, Naughty Dog wanted the gunplay to be extremely unreasonably basic in Jack 2 and by requiring any sort of aiming at all, they didn't go far enough, which is misguided in and of itself. Two, they wanted there to be at least some aiming skill involved, but after they couldn't find a happy middle ground with Jack 2, instead of redesigning the gunplay entirely to fix the issue, they gave up on trying to make it work and created a bunch of guns which are even more automated. 
The best evidence I can point out to support this is that there isn't any combat whatsoever between getting the blaster rifle from Jack 2 back and getting the new Ricochet mod. Regardless of speculation, the new guns make Jack 3's combat an absolute joke. The spin kick shot was unbalanced as it was in Jack 2, but here it's on another level entirely. With those 5 or 6 shots ricocheting around and hitting enemies 2 or 3 times each, nothing can even touch you. With all these guns that don't require any aiming, gun combat works the same way as the car with the automatic turret. The homing shot from the minigun is especially ridiculous. Holding the fire button will send out a constant stream of homing shots in all directions. With all these weapons functioning so automatically, Jack 3's gun combat never presents a challenge, not once. I think this goes to show that the difficulty of Jack 2 and 3, whether it be legendarily difficult or easy as piss, often came from a bad place. In Jack 2, the game's imprecise aiming controls could lead to unfair situations where the player was incapable of hit-stunning attacking enemies. It was often the fault of the aiming controls if you were shot. In Jack 3, because aiming is practically removed altogether, it's so easy to hit stun an enemy that none of them stand a chance. Naughty Dog actually had a fair few options when trying to make Jack 3 fairer. They could have overhauled the aiming entirely to allow the necessary level of accuracy, which would have been the best choice as it would have made the game fair while also maintaining the level of difficulty. They could have redesigned the way combat takes place to better fit the existing controls, which is an idea they actually do flirt with. We'll come to that later as well. They could have done nothing and made another unfair game, god forbid, but the cheap and nasty fix was to make a game that seems fair because it's so pathetically easy to hit stun all the unfair enemies. In other words, the difficulty of the ranged combat in these two games, hard or easy, has always come from the imprecise aiming controls, and never from any fair enemy or combat design. Imprecise controls are not a challenge to be mastered, they just make the game seem harder because they're inadequate for their intended purpose. Jack 3 gives up and drops the idea of challenge altogether instead of taking the opportunity to fix the problems. Still, difficulty is not the be-all and end-all. In fact, it's really just the motivating factor in the overall design of the combat. You don't need to be constantly taking damage for combat to be well designed. Even games with very low average death counts can have engaging combat if they use their mechanics in varied ways. With 12 guns in the game now, there's a massive pool of mechanics available. Why not have some enemies that can only be damaged by certain guns? What if some ranged enemies took high damage from the blaster and low damage from the minigun, but only the minigun could hit stun them? How about an enemy type which needs to be carried into a pool of water with the anti-grav before being electrocuted with the arc wielder? None of these scenarios would make the game more difficult in the traditional sense because none of them involve the enemies being significantly more likely to hit Jack, but they would all involve a little more involvement. The player would need to be paying more attention to succeed, reading enemy behaviours and visual designs to figure out which guns they should be using and when. Instead, Jack 3 falls into the same trap as the last game. We have the same melee enemies and the same ranged enemies, never anything that requires more thought than pressing the trigger. There were no cases where I couldn't have just equipped the ricochet shot and done the old spin kick. In the Jack 2 video, I said that the camera angle for character relative aiming was at least more consistent with the platforming than, say, putting in a strafe button like Ratchet and Clank. If keeping that consistency results in gunplay this shallow and unsatisfying, it's absolutely not worth the trade-off, but I admit I can't think of a solution to this problem except adding strafing and introducing that perspective dichotomy. Devil May Cry uses snappy lock-on, but this only works because the guns don't exist to deal large amounts of damage. In the context of Jack, snapping between targets to shoot them dead would be just as oversimple and unsatisfying as what we have in Jack 3. Gaming has wised up to even trying character relative aiming these days. There have been too many bad examples of it over the years, just like Jack. 
I think maintaining that perspective is an admirable goal, and I'd like to believe someone smarter than me has an idea to make it work. So it brings me no joy to have to call Naughty Dog's attempt a failure on all counts. And there's one mission that suggests to me that Naughty Dog were aware. It would be an unremarkable gunplay mission in the open world, but the camera perspective is fixed overhead and all your guns are taken away except the basic blaster rifle. It comes across more like a mini game. This is the one time in the game where the combat poses a challenge and the aiming controls feel suitable. With the camera angle fixed to a bird's eye view, we're now seeing Jack from the perspective of my old diagram. The camera is aligned to a 2D plane, along what would usually be the X and Z axes, which are the two that the player has control of when aiming. From this angle, the movement of the analog stick is directly represented by the direction of aiming on screen. Normally, the camera is aligned to the Y axis, which is the only one the player gets no input on when aiming, because the analog stick doesn't have a Y axis either. With only the two most relevant dimensions to worry about and a static camera, it's now much clearer that Jack aims exactly where you point the stick. They've had to remove an entire dimension and all the player's most effective weapons just to create a scenario where these gunplay controls are ideal. It's kind of embarrassing. This one-off, almost mini-gamey mission is better than every single instance of the gunplay from the three-dimensional angle it was created for. Perhaps Naughty Dog should have been making twin stick shooters instead. Though it's not surprising that a one-off would show the rest of the game up like this. It's just the law of averages, because Jack 3 has many games in spades. If we assume that the core mechanics of the game are the four from Jack 2, platforming, gunplay, hovercar driving and hoverboarding, and add buggy driving since that's the new focus here, then Jack 3's throwaway mechanics include Simon Says, Leaper Racing, Hang Gliding, Stationary Turret Sections, Moving Turret Sections, Precursor Kart Racing, Missile Guidance, Escaping Missiles in a hovercar that controls completely differently to everything else, Spiderbot Piloting, Star Fox, Mech Piloting, and Pac-Man. I honestly wonder if I should be judging Jack 3 as a mini-game collection rather than a Jack and Daxter game. That sounds stupid, but remember, I didn't conclude Jack 2 was a bad Jack and Daxter game, I concluded that it was an aimless hodgepodge of mechanics. If Jack 3 is then an even more aimless collection of mini-games, should I be judging it on those mini-games or on its core mechanics? In the end, I ask myself three questions. Which parts of the game appeared to have had the most effort put into them? Which parts would I want more of, perhaps explored further if there were to be a sequel? Which parts will I remember, for better or worse? The only three answers that apply to all three of those questions were the platforming levels, because at its core Jack 3 still has the satisfying platforming moveset of Jack 1, the hoverboarding sections, for again having the standout level design, and the gunplay, though that's only because I want to see it done better. As I was editing this together, I realised that the buggy driving can probably apply to all three of those questions as well. If nothing else, Jack X proves that it definitely applies to the second one. It's not going to change the point I'm about to make, but I'm nothing if not fair, right? I don't feel I need to go in depth on why the Pac-Man minigame is good or bad. I don't think I need to break down the mech's moveset or make diagrams to demonstrate how aiming works while piloting the Spider-Bot, because the issue isn't with the quality of these mechanics. It's that half of Jack 3 is taken up by them, these simplistic mechanics that only see one or two uses. They either do all they can do in the space of five minutes, aren't enjoyable, or don't last long enough to be a significant part of Jack 3 that I'll remember. In the Jack 2 video, I talked about mechanical consistency when discussing difficulty. To add to that, if a throwaway mechanic isn't difficult on its first appearance, it's easier to forgive, to an extent. If Jack 2's Simon Says minigame had been significantly easier, it would still feel out of place, but wouldn't be blocking progress behind such a demanding test of a random skill. Most of Jack 3's minigames fall into this category, 
The game is extremely mechanically inconsistent, but none of the throwaway mechanics are difficult enough to block progress for very long. Jack 3's mechanical inconsistency isn't an issue of difficulty then, it's simply an issue of focus. There are 11 linear platforming missions in Jack 3, and about as many hoverboarding ones. There are 60 missions in the game. When only one third of the game focuses on the enjoyable mechanics that will be remembered, with the rest flitting between ideas which are forgotten before they're properly explored, any hope of mechanical focus is lost. Of the eight hours you'll spend playing Jack 3, only about three of them will be spent platforming and hoverboarding. A game which tries to do everything is a game that doesn't have time to be excellent at anything. Even if you enjoyed Naughty Dog's little interpretation of Pac-Man, you're only getting that once. The next mission might be piloting a mech, which you might absolutely hate, but you're in luck, you're only getting that once too. I hesitate to use a food metaphor, believe me, but to hell with it. Jack 3 is like a cheese platter where the cheeses don't exist anywhere else. You liked our Spiderbot controls? Better play that mission again, there's nothing else quite like it. This is my issue with cramming in this degree of gameplay variety. You're throwing ideas at a wall in hopes that players will like one of them, but even when they do, you've moved on to try your luck with something else. The contradiction is that when you present that platter, every minigame needs to hit for the overall package to be a good game. You can't try your luck with 10 different things and then point to the two good ones if all 10 have to be completed to roll credits. This is why I'm a big advocate of games doing one or two things well instead of 10 things passably. I know I like platformers, so I pay attention to all the new releases. I know I don't like turret sections, so I don't play rail shooters. I don't know if I like Jack 3, because sometimes it's being a competent platformer and other times it's being a gun range. Do I recommend it to someone because they like Star Fox, or steer them clear because they don't like open world driving games? Platformers often get away with some variety like this. The first Ratchet and Clank had breaks in the base gameplay for ship combat, but they were infrequent enough that their simplicity didn't disrupt the game. They certainly didn't need to be there, in fact the effort might have been better spent creating another level, but it was still clearly a platformer with some ship combat, not a minigame collection weighted slightly towards platforming. If you hated the ship combat with a passion, it was a brief misfire before you were platforming again, before you were doing the thing the game promised again. In Jack 3 it's the opposite, you're spending the majority of your time playing mini-games in the hopes the game might allow you to platform for a few minutes. I think there are better ways to inject variety into a game besides creating another set of mechanics. This is something I touched on briefly in the Jack 2 video when talking about level design. The single biggest problem with Jack 3 is that it constantly introduces new throwaway mechanics instead of ever exploring the good ones it already has. For example, the pre-existing platforming mechanics could have been explored and rethought through the addition of this time slowing power. Jack can use it to jump across platforms which are rotating too fast at normal speed. This could have gone further and combined with combat in a way which didn't require gunplay. How about a scenario where Jack could slow time and run across a bridge with an enemy on it? The bridge would begin to crumble under their weight, and then on the other side, Jack could restore time to send the enemy falling to their death. What about jumping onto a crumbling platform, but instead of jumping straight off, you had to slow time and jump between the pieces as they fell, eventually jumping onto a much lower platform once the pieces had fallen far enough? These ideas require a gimmick, the time slowing power, which interacts with the platforming to vary the mechanic and make the player approach it differently. After the slow-mo is activated, the player has access to their usual platforming moveset, but now they can think about platforming with a different mindset. This could just as easily be platforms which slowly crumble on their own, the slow-mo is just an example. In the actual Jack 3, not my hypothetical version of it with good platforming variety, the slow-mo is never, not once, used outside of the precursor temple level where it's first taught. You can use it in combat, but does the game really need to be any more pathetically easy? Again, just like every other suggestion, all these elements are already here. The game proves that the engine can handle forming individual platforms from pieces of a collapsing bridge in the very last use of the mechanic before it's thrown in the trash. 
All that was needed was a repeat of the scenario later on, where the player had to jump between the pieces again, but also wait for them to fall a bit further to carry them to a lower platform. In my mind, that would feel even more awesome to pull off than the first bridge collapse. In retrospect, this particular missed opportunity might be my biggest disappointment with any part of Jack 3. It's the root of my problem with Jack 3's level design even when it is firing on all cylinders and being a platformer. Instead of rethinking the mechanics they already had, the developers just built a massive pile of mini-games to provide a sense of variety. When a new gimmick is introduced that could bring a new perspective to the game design, it's only around for as long as one of the mini-games, used for 5 minutes and forgotten. Better put in some more bottomless pits and groups of reused enemies instead, but make it easier this time. As I played Jack 3, I imagined this concluding statement going somewhat like the one at the end of the Crash 3 video. The game is brought down by a lack of focus, what little of the Crash or Jack formula is here is the best it's ever been, it's just a shame there's not more of it. But the more I think about it, I'm not sure the Jack formula, or at least the Jack 2 and 3 formula, has ever been good in the first place. It piggybacks off the movement mechanics of Jack 1, which were solid enough to be satisfying in any context, but I'm not sure if Jack 3 ever arrives at anything more than that. A solid foundation ripped from another game surrounded by clutter, never doing anything that's both enjoyable and all its own. It's one or the other. It's either trying to combine Jack 1's movement with some original gunplay and utterly failing, or using those movement mechanics as a crutch to remind us of the good times and not doing anything we haven't seen three times over. When both of those turn out unsatisfactory, it throws in buggies and one-off minigames in a desperate attempt to be good at something, even just accidentally, even just for a few minutes. Deciding between Jack 2 and 3 is a game of compromises. I prefer the piss-easy combat of Jack 3, but only because aiming felt so awful in Jack 2. I prefer the platforming in Jack 2, but only because Jack 3 is about one-sixth platformer. Jack 3 is a game which always needs a but after giving it praise. The platforming mechanics are satisfying, but the level design does nothing with them. The driving mechanics would be interesting, but the game never justifies making them so complex. There are things in Jack 3 to enjoy, but... Thanks for watching, and an even bigger thanks if you've watched the Jack 2 video before this one. That's a significant time investment you've made to the channel, and I hope it was worth taking the chance. Just a bit of housekeeping, first off, I do want to do a video on Jack X before moving on to Uncharted, but I know far fewer people have played that game compared to the main trilogy. I'm thinking I'll just give some scattered thoughts in a video around the length of my Crash Team Racing one instead of a retrospective analysis like this. It'll just be some basic reasons why I think you should play it. The other thing was, there's a pastebin link in the description with a few thoughts I cut from this video script. There was nothing necessarily wrong with them, but they were surface level, and I felt I had deeper fish to fry. In MS Word it was about two pages long, that's there if you're interested. Thanks again.